So behind us here is the site of uh, Hobart's first water supply, where crystal clear water would come down from Mount Wellington and be piped down into the city. Uh, but today, water is industrialised. Uh, toxic chemicals are added to the water. Chlorine, a poisonous gas used in the First World War. And fluoride that can cause uh, ligament calcification. Well, that's what I would say if I wanted to create a horror story about water supplies. Uh, but I don't. Uh, in fact, today we're going to talk about Hobart's water supply and uh, the impact or not of salmon farming on it. So first up, salmon, Atlantic salmon, are an anadromous fish, which means they begin their life in fresh water and then they mature and live their adult life in salt water. So in that regard, the fish need to begin their life in fresh water when they're being farmed. Now, ironically, the theme of uh, Richard's book is that uh, we should be moving to land-based farming. But the first chapter of his book where he examines the farming in detail is an attack on land-based farming. Now we have two types of hatchery in Tasmania. We have flow-through hatcheries where essentially the water comes from the river, flows through the hatchery and then returns to, to the river, uh, ideally through some kind of filtration system. And that, those flow through hatcheries are generally now used for broodstock. That is the large adult fish that become the parents of the next generation. Although some still uh, flow through hatcheries still exist for smolt. So smolt production is the production of the fish to a stage where they're ready to go to sea. And most of that production is in what's called recirculating aquaculture system hatcheries. Where the water is filtered, treated and then circulated around again. So, Richard begins this chapter by talking about how toxic chemicals of ammonia and nitrite, toxic to fish, are released from fish hatcheries. Well, that is correct. Ammonia and nitrite are toxic to fish. Uh, anyone who's got an aquarium would know about those, but anyone who's got an aquarium would know that their fish are still alive. So how is that? Well, that's because we use a thing called biofiltration or nitrification where bacteria convert the ammonia into nitrite and then another bacteria convert the nitrite into nitrate so it's nitrate we need to be worrying about not ammonia not nitrite or as he commonly refers to urea and i don't know why that is because urea is only 10 percent of the excretion of of fish so nitrate, so we all know that nitrate is a fertiliser. It fertilises land crops, it fertilises um, marine crops and water crops. Um, and an excess of nitrate can cause algal blooms, blue-green algal blooms, as Christine uh, Kokenau uh, is cited by Richard as doing in the Derwent. But the problem that we have with our water supply, the bad taste and the bad odour that we had uh, back in, uh, in the day, was not caused by the blue-green algae directly, but possibly indirectly. Because the compounds which caused the water to taste and smell bad were two compounds, one called jossamine and the other one called 2-methyl isoborneol, better known to us farmers as MIB. And they're the compounds that make the water, or in fact the fish, taste earthy or muddy. And anyone who's caught a trout from a highland lake would have tasted that muddy flavour before. So, Jossamine and MIB can be produced by blue-green algae, but not by the, the green macroalgae that, uh, that Flanagan alleges. But mainly, Jossamine and MIB are produced by filamentous bacteria, uh, rather than the algae. So here, I guess, we need to examine the concept called correlation versus causation. Because too often in Richard's book, he talks about something that happens, and then he implies that it causes something else. Now, if I click my fingers and that crow crows, I haven't caused that crow to crow. I have merely, is a, it's merely a correlation. At the same time I click my fingers, that, cho that crow chose to crow. Uh, unless, of course, you believe in butterflies flapping its wings and the chaos theory, but let's not get into that. So let's have a look at the location of this hatchery. Well, this is the Derwent River system. This is the location of the hatchery in concern. And this is the location all the way down here of the seagrass beds at Granton that have apparently been so negatively impacted by the runoff from that hatchery. And approximately here is the location of the Bryn Eston plant for the Hobart water supply. So let's zoom in a little bit further and see what we can see. 
First up, I guess Richard Flanagan says that there are no significant agricultural operations downstream of the, of the hatchery and all of them are upstream, thinking that nutrients don't actually flow downstream. But never mind, let's have a bit of a closer look. So we zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and until finally we can see this very small salmon hatchery in the scheme of things. So let's just go for a little bit of a trip downriver and see whether there are no agricultural, significant agricultural uh, operations as claimed in Richard's book. So here we go. Now, um, these uh, these green circle things uh, looks like uh, irrigation to me. There's some more. Let's go a little bit further downstream. We've got some more. Let's zoom out a bit to make this journey downstream just a little bit quicker. Some more large irrigation. More, more. More large irrigation. Even more. As we get further downstream, we find um, what's this? This is certainly some large agricultural enterprise. And again, large hop fields. So cut to the chase. You've got to get a pretty good imagination if you don't think that there are any significant agricultural operations downstream of that very small hatchery. So Richard alleges that the EPA never investigated whether the taste or odour compounds produced by them were produced by the hatchery. Why? Well, firstly, it's too hard to determine any one particular nitrate source from all of those agricultural sources and that one tiny hatchery. But secondly, because we know that from, from some research that the nitrate levels do not have any impact upon the production of Jossamon or MIB, as this article shows. Evaluation of the impact of nitrate and nitrogen levels in recirculating aquaculture systems on the concentrations of off flavour compounds, Jossamon and 2 methyl isoborneol in water with rainbow trout. And the highlight nitrate levels did not directly impact Jossamon levels in water or fish from the recirculating aquaculture system. So, yes, there was a problem with the odour and the taste of the water, but it wasn't caused directly or likely even directly by salmon farming. But here's the killer. So from page 17 of Flanagan's book, um, and I'm reading actually from the extract from the monthly web page here, we can see that he says, Kokenhauer explains that in 2015, following the opening by Hewan Aquaculture of a large smolt hatchery below Meadowbank Dam on the Derwent River, green algal blooms began appearing in the river. So extreme were these blooms that they threatened internationally significant seagrass beds and wetlands around Granton, an area sometimes described as the kidneys of the Derwent. At the same time, there was a public outcry about the bad taste and bad smell of Hobart's drinking water. Hang on, when was this? Let's, let's see what Taz Water have got to say. earthy drinking water. During the summer of 2014, there was a sudden and noticeable increase in the number of customers contacting Taz Water. Their concern was regarding an earthy or musty taste and smell for the tap water. 2014, a whole year before the hatchery. Well, sorry, nothing to see here. Thank <laughs> you.